James Cagney and the Medicine Woman, Tarita McKell. James Cagney, that's right. Um, May 14th, the SF Poetry Center is presenting a very special tribute to Atel Adnan uh, with Camila Roy, Fodu Judua, Azania al Suiz, and others. Um, May 19th is the monthly Latinx reading series that's been happening here, speaking at Shalot, with the features Gustavo Barajona Lopez and Lupita Limon Corrales. And May 28th, we're featuring an OG Chicano poet from way back when, Roberto Tinoco Duran. So uh, please check in with us. Uh, look at the uh, webpage. There's like 17 other readings happening this month. So please, please keep coming back. But tonight, oh man, oh man. Uh, like I said yesterday, this is one of those readings that you dream about, and it, but it's actually happening. So it's very, very special. Uh, let me just get out of here and let the one and only Sid introduce it properly, all right? Give it up for Sid. Well, thank you so much, Josiah. Uh, yeah, first, first off, I just want to thank Medicine for Nightmares for being just such an incredible space, an essential community space. Um, please buy some books, support them, support the bookstore. Um, they've just been great hosts and just so welcoming here. Um, and uh, as far as small press traffic, we do events um, around San Francisco at various locations. Um, it, San Francisco is also known as Yalamu to the Remind Tush Ohlone people. We also do events occasionally in the East Bay, uh, known as Hachin to the Chechenyo speaking Lushan Ohlone people. And we stand in solidarity with um, 
indigenous movements uh, struggling for rematriation of land and self-determination. Uh, I want to thank the Queer Cultural Center for co-sponsoring this event. Um, the program was also made possible by California Humanities and California Arts Council, so thank you to them as well. Um, and uh, most importantly, Javier Huerta, who made this whole pro uh, program happen. Um, I said last night, I was raving about him last night, about um, how I've followed his work for over a decade, and um, we've worked for a while on this, and um, I just, he has approached this whole program very thoughtfully and with a lot of intention, and I think that he brought just an outstanding um, group of poets t for us to um, enjoy their work and also hear them in conversation. So thank you all for being here. Um, super appreciate um, the, um, the attentiveness and um, I'm gonna get out of the way right now and let's welcome Javier, thank you. Hello, um, I have everyone's books, that's what I was carrying. And uh, thank you, Sid, and um, it's been great working with, uh, with Sid. You know, uh, I, I had the, the idea of who I wanted to invite uh, for, this, for this event, for this showcase. It actually started last night, so if you weren't here and didn't, didn't catch it, uh, didn't catch uh, JT, mm -hmm. Alini, who thank you for joining us again, and, and Alan, who is, walking in and, and also uh, thank you for joining us again uh, tonight, Alan. It was a great reading and it is available now uh, as a recording uh, online because we, we live streamed it just like we're going to live stream tonight uh, and it is available. Uh, so we wanted to continue that t today and um, my interest in this, in this um, grouping and this event, um, you know, happened as a, as a writer, I started writing about my own experience, uh, my own uh, undocumented experience of crossing the Rio, Rio Grande when I was seven and then having an undocumented childhood until the uh, I, IRCA Act uh, in 86, which I pretty much just dated myself. <laughs> uh, and um, there is distance there right, from that experience that I have to, to now. And you know, my, my second book is more about uh, you know, what does it mean to, to have amnesty and to, to, to be a citizen? But um, so that, you know, that, that's my, my interest in this. And um, I said, you know, undocumented experience in the singular, but you know, what I, what I quickly learned was that it's really more about um, undocumented experiences, right, in, in, in the plural. Uh, and I think that part of what we wanted to do with this showcase was to get a diversity of voices and a diversity of experiences, uh, diversities in uh, national origins, uh, diversity in styles too, which I think is very important, right? Uh, having a multimedia work uh, like Alain's, having performance work like JT and, and Yosimar, and having a kind of, you know, a, a narrative lyrical type of poetry of Alini and, and Javier, and then the very vibrant uh, uh, visual uh, work of uh, Gladys. Uh, so um, today we, we have three readers too who have been um, I think at the forefront, they're very, you know, one of the voices, uh, two of the voices that have been um, the, the loudest and the strongest, uh, Yosimar and, and, and Javier, I mean that in a good way, <laughs> loud and strong. Uh, and then also a new, new vibrant uh, voice here. Um, I, in my first book, I, I, I wrote a, a poem, it was actually the first poem that I ever published outside of my friend circle, you know how your friends publish you, and you're like, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, but so it was the first poem that I published outside of my, and this is when you still had to write a, a form, uh, form letter and mail it in, the submission, and, uh, and I did that, it was for an anthology, but I was, I was submitting to a lot of places, so you know, uh, it was a form letter, and, and I, I, got my, I got my submission back, and v I, I believe it was Virgil Suarez, who was the editor for this anthology, uh, circled uh, my, where I said, I, I, I'm submitting this too, and then I had the wrong name, the wrong publication. <laughs> but I'm like, who, you know, they went out of their way to like send this back, so it must mean that they, you know, so you're gonna have to persist this. I, I corrected it and sent it right back, and it was uh, published, and uh, the title of the poem was called Toward a Portrait of the Undocumented, and it was published in a, in a book that was uh, titled Red, Red, White, and Blues. I don't know, playing with <laughs> there. Um, 
but that you know that that poem was a, you know kind of metaphorical play and kind of refusing narratives um, and myths that we 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 you know we we tell ourselves in this country about uh, immigration and and migrants and. I think that the three voices that uh, the three poets and their work that we have today um, continue to do, th do that, right? It's, it's, uh, if it's toward a portrait of the documents, it is plural as well. And, and, and the, these poets and their work have been creating their own portraits, right, of, of what it means to, to be themselves, but then also with this aspect of undocumented migration. Uh, so I hope you, you all are ex excited as I am to, to, hear, to hear them. Um, it's great to have them all in, in, in one place, and um, I'm going to introduce all three poets in the order that they're going to read, and then uh, we want to have a Q&A afterward. So let me go ahead and, and read the official bios for the poets. So first we have Javier Zamora. Uh, he was born in El Salvador in 1990. His father fled El Salvador when he was a year old and his mother when he was about to turn five. In 1999, Javier migrated through Guatemala, Mexico, and the Sonoran Desert. His debut poetry collection, Un Accompa Unaccompanied, explores how immigration and the Civil War have impacted his family. Samora was a 2018-2019 Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard University and holds fellowships from McDowell, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Poetry Foundation. Stanford University and Yaddo. He is also the recipient of a 2017 Lenin Literary Fellowship and the 2017 Narrative Prize Award. His memoir Solito will be published in September 2022 by Hogarth, uh, so forthcoming uh, soon. And um, you know, when he started blowing up, I was like, oh, I'm not even poor laureate of, of my own name, uh, which is a, <laughs> a shock to me for. Uh, uh, next, we have uh, 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 Gladys, who, you know, I've, um, I just, you know, been amazed by the work, because uh, I, I just discovered Gladys, and thanks to Alan, I just discovered uh, Gladys's work in the last uh, year or so. Um, Gladys is a Kenyan-born writer, artist, designer, teacher, and activist from Lawrence, Massachusetts. As an artist, she lives by Audre Lorde's words, your silence will not protect you. She's the author of poetry collections, There's the Truth, Then There Are Other Things, and I'm Not Allowed to Explain, Only Foreshadow and Reminisce. Her writing and activism center around her experiences taking up space on American soil as an immigrant, queer, African femme. Gladys is the co-founder and prose editor at Exposed Brick Liter Literary Magazine and an eighth grade ELA teacher. She is currently pursuing her master's in literary arts from the Bread Loaf School of English at Middlebury College. Uh, you can support their work at GladysRangesi.com. And then our third reader is going to be Yosima Reyes. Uh, Yossi is a nationally acclaimed poet and public speaker born in Guerrero, Mexico and raised in Eastside, San Jose. Reyes explores the themes of migration and sexuality in his work. The advocate named Reyes one of 13 LGBT Latinos changing the world and Remezcla included Reyes on their list of 10 up and coming Latinx poets you need to know. Um, so please help me welcome our first reader, and, uh, <laughs> Javier. Gracias, Tocayo. Um, it's an honor to be back here in the mission. Um, I live in Tucson, of all places. It's weird that I live in the place where I cross the border, but I love it. It's been a weird change, and thank you for my mom for being here. Um, <laughs> it just happened to be Mother's Day, you know, uh, <laughs> soon. Um, and thank you. Um, Gladys and Yossi for your work, and it's an honor to read with the both of you. Um, Yossi and El Tocayo were the first people that were quote unquote out in their undocumented status back in 2008, and that's when I began to write, right? And so whatever my trajectory, I owe it 
to the both of you because you were out there first and really gave me the okay to talk about this shit, which is hard to talk about. Um, so it's dope to have the greeting. And I'll start um, with this poem because it doesn't, I wrote this right when Trump got elected, but I didn't know that he was gonna be elected. So the title of it's to president elect, because it doesn't fucking matter who the president is. Um, there's still gonna be fucked up shit uh, to your missing. To president elect. There's no fence. There's a tunnel. There's a hole in the wall. Yes, you think right now no one's running? Then who is it that sweats and shits their shit there for the cactus? We craved water. Our piss turned the brightest yellow. I am not the only nine-year-old who has slipped my backpack under the rancher's fences. I'm still in that van that picked us up from Devil's Highway. The white van honked three times, honks heard by German shepherds, helicopters, migra trucks. I don't know where the dry backs are who ran with dogs chasing after them. Correction, I do know. At night, they return to say, sobreviviste, bicho, sobreviviste, carnal. Yes, we overlived. Um, thank you. And now I'll read it in Spanish, because fuck it. Um, Corriendo, no hay muro, hay un túnel, un hoyo en la pared, sí. ¿Pensás que ahorita nadie está corriendo? ¿Quién es, pues, el que suda y caga su mierda en el cactus? Añoramos agua, nuestro orín se hizo amarillo, amarillo. Yo no soy el único bicho con su mochila debajo de los cercos de los gringos. Todavía voy en esa van blanca que nos recogió en el Devil's Highway. La van blanca pitó tres veces, pero escuchamos a los pastores alemanes, helicópteros, la migra. No sé a dónde están los espaldas secas que corrieron cuando los chuchos los seguían. Corrección, sí sé. Por la noche regresan para decirme, sobreviviste, bicho, sobreviviste, carnal. Pues sí, sobre requete que vivimos. Yeah. I'm used to Zoom silence after. <laughs> um, we'll go. So I immigrated, I crossed the border once, they caught us, they deported us back. We said we were Mexicans in 1999, they were believing that shit, still they do. Um, but now they don't care, they just deport you across the border. Um, and so I remember being, Nogales was split by the border, and I remember being on the Mexican side, and now as an adult realizing um, you would call those uh, the people that I witnessed houseless, and they were going across to the Mexican side to buy food, and then they didn't have to show proof of ID because that's how the border crosses happened right back then. And as even as a nine-year-old, I was like, why can they do that? And we can't just cross the border. And this is citizenship. <coughs> It was clear they were hungry. With their carts empty, the clothes inside their empty hands, they were hungry because their hands were empty, their hands in trash cans. The trash cans on the street, the asphalt street on the red dirt, the dirt taxpayers pay for up to that invisible line, visible thick white paint, visible booth, visible with the fence starting from the booth, booth, road, booth, road, booth, road, office building, then the fence, 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 fence. It started from a corner with an iron pole, always an iron pole at the beginning. Those men, those women could walk between booths, say hi to white or brown officers, no problem. The problem, I think, were carts 
belts, jackets we didn't have any, or maybe not the problem. Our skin sunburned, all of us spoke Spanish, we didn't know how they had ended up that way, on that side. We didn't know how we had ended up here. We didn't know, but we understood why they walked the opposite direction to buy food on this side. This side, we all know, is hunger. Um, and now, because of Josie, too, fucking, I, he was the first one to say, oh, what about all your poems are fucking sad? What about happy poems? <laughs> um, which, you know, you're fucking right. Um, and it's been quite the ride, not during the pandemic. I love dancing. I love drinking. And so <laughs> now I'm, like, trying to mix that into the work and still keep it political. And so this is, I think, not the best thing that has come out of that project. Um, and if you know anything about merengue and the 90s, you know who Quinito Mendez is. And Quinito Mendez, and you probably know this song, Cachamba, so I'm gonna play a little bit. So I emulated the rhythm and also the structure, which I use the same, you'll, you'll hear it, but I use the same structure to make fun of the chain of command of Homeland Security. And so this is the song. So he, he repeats it and he builds up on it. And this is my version. There's a wall featuring merengue legend Quinito Mendez's Cachamba. And his call and response on this one, by the way. There's a wall, there's a wall. There's a wall where people are tanning Speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall near the Mexican desert. There's an agent, there's an agent, there's an agent. Chicken necks running toward the people with Speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of the Mexican desert. There's a deputy, there's a deputy, there's a deputy who ordered the agent to arrest the people in Speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. A commissioner, a commissioner, commissioner who said no, secretary who said yes, to the deputy who ordered the agent running at the people tanning Speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. There's a deputy dec secretary, the secretary, secretary who told commissioner, I'm in charge, commissioner who told deputy no, who told the agent arrest the people tanning in Speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. The president, or oh, the president, president who said you're fired to the secretary who said I'm in charge commissioner who told deputy no who sent agent running toward the tanners in speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the mexican desert and the wall is me yes it's me i'm wearing a speedo yes he is inside a bikini yes he is i'm not mexican no he's not let me tan please let him be please let me breathe let him live fuck wp just fuck them please i see i see i see mamacita i see i see i see Thank you. And I'll end it with the song I end every reading with. Um, and this is, is about a funeral, my funeral, but I think this is the poem that I had the most fun in in my first day. Um, and all you need to know is that Estero de Jaltepec is the mangrove forest that I grew up in. Como tu is a shout out to Roque Dalton, and he's a Salvadoran poet, and that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Instructions for my funeral. Don't Burn me in no steel furnace. Burn me in Abuelita's garden. Wrap me in blue, white, and blue. A la mierda, patriotismo. 
douse me in the cheapest gin. Whatever you do, don't judge my home. Cut my bones with a machete till I'm finest dust. Wrap my pito in panties so I dream of pisadas. Please, no priests, no crosses, no flowers. Steal a flask and stash me inside. Blast music, dress to impress. Please be drunk, miss work, y pisen otra vez. Bust out the drums, the army strums. Bust out the guitars, guerrillero strummed. And listen to the war inside. Please, no American mierdas. Carouse the procession dancing to the pier. Moor me in a motorboat. De veras que sea una lancha driven by a nine-year-old son of a fisherman. Scud to the center of the Estero de Jaltepec. Read como tú and toss pieces of bread. As the motorboat circles, open the flask so I'm brief like a jacaranda, like a flor de mayo, like an alcatraz. Then forget me and let me drift. Gracias. Wow, that was so powerful. Thank you, Javier. Um, I am so honored to be here today. My name is Gladys. Um, I just wanna say, like Javier has said, so many people in this room have paved the way for me as a, a writer and as an undocumented poet. Um, shout out Alan, who Alan is the first person I ever met who was undocumented and went to college and was in my calculus classroom in high school randomly. And I was like, oh, that person isn't going to college. I'm gonna go to college too. And I. I went, and then it's a funny story. I wrote a book about it, so we'll talk about that later. And then Josie also paving the way, talking about the struggle, and then Javier, who I'm so impressed by your work, and I love that book. I'm obsessed with that book, so so honored to be here with y'all. I have a video that should be queued up, and then I have a, a quick presentation, so we'll start with the video. Every time I open these pages, I find the answer or I find that I've already found the answer. If it's written in green, then I found it in abundance. If it's written in red, then I found it in the middle of grading and desperation. If it's written in ballpoint, then I must have been in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Must have fashioned shelter with these pages, squeezed ink from a nearby carcass, both blood and bone, forced myself to tell the truth with only the sun and the shadows of my limbs, as is the case with ballpoints. Nonetheless, the answer is there, in a cursive only decipherable to teachers and lovers, my only fault is this, that I close this book and forget it, forget the answer and spend my day looking for it all over again. Every time I open these pages, I find the answer or I find that I've already found the answer. If it's written in green, then I found it in abundance. If it's written in red, then I found it in the middle of grading and desperation. If it's written in ballpoint, then I must have been in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights must have fashioned shelter with these pages, squeezed ink from a nearby carcass, both blood and bone, forced myself to tell the truth with only the sun and the shadow. Every time I open these pages, I find the answer or the presentation. I find we can talk a little bit more about that second book. Um, do you have the presentation? Yeah, let me just queue it up. So my little talk today is about my evolution as a writer. And um, as you can see, there's a lot of doodles, which I love. I'm wearing like the same shirt on right now that you, you can buy on my website. Um, and it's about telling stories that are hard, that you don't wanna tell 
Um, and, and for a lot of us, stories that will get us in trouble and will get our families in trouble. And um, I've always been a writer. I've always known that about myself. But there was a thing that happened to me that made me not want to write um, for many, many reasons. And this was my journey back to myself as a writer. Next. Um, next. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, like um, Javier had said, uh, my name is Gladys. I came to America when I was seven years old. I came for my father's master's graduation, and then we got stuck in America. So it was an accident, and didn't want to come, didn't have any like reason to come to America because it was better, like Kenya was lit, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had a great time in Kenya, and we lived, like my parents were teachers, we lived on campus at this like private school, like, you know, they had broken their, they broke their generational curses, and we were living that life, and then we came to America, and we just, we're here now, and um, I ended up living in a neighborhood called um, Lawrence, Massachusetts, which is a Dominican immigrant neighborhood. Um, so I grew up with a bunch of Dominicans. I still don't know Spanish, um, <laughs> but yeah, and I, I built a lot of my artistry there. So yeah, this is from the photo shoot. Next. Um, so what I wanna talk about is um, this idea of dispossession. And when I went to college, um, which shout out Alan for encouraging me and like showing me the way, um, it was really hard to get into college as an undocumented kid, for those of y'all who know. Um, I ended up, th when I was applying for college, my family started going through deportation proceedings. And instead of sitting there with them and, and like figuring out what that meant, I got a full ride to a school and I just went to that school. Um, and I didn't process what was going on. My family didn't really process what was going on. I just know I had to go to court sometimes and get my fingerprints done sometimes. And, and then other things started happening at school. And for a lot of reasons, I couldn't address them appropriately because I couldn't be in any legal trouble, right? Because I was in the removal proceedings. Um, and I experienced a lot of dispossession at school, um, some of it around you know, home because I was like, I don't fit in here and I can't go home. Um, my body was being violated in all these ways I didn't trust and I didn't like. Um, I lost a lot of my language as a writer. I couldn't speak about it. I, um, education was weird because I was like at this ivory tower, but I was like, I was in this class where undocumented folks where no one was undocumented but me and I was failing and it was like, is this the, the research? Am I the research? <laughs> um, and then I also felt very dispossessed of my blackness because the same sort of project of like people studied blackness, but they didn't know how to interact with black people. Um, and so this flag is then so this is a Kenyan flag for those of y'all who don't know. I think we live in a lot of immigrant spaces where we don't know anything about each other's cultures. We just know about like not being American, right? Um, and I, I, I do a lot because it helps me like deconstruct the ideas of nationhood and identity. And even though I wanna like, you know, shout out Kenya, like I don't also have any loyalty to the Kenyan government or you, a Kenyan nationhood. And I don't think a lot of us would if we went back to our homelands. So I've been trying to do a lot of flags of different countries, um, of my, the people that I love, of people around me, um, and also deconstruct them and be like, even if we went home, would we feel at home there? What issues exist there? And like, are we gonna align ourselves with the government and the nation of that country? Probably not, but uh, it's nice to see the colors, right? Um, so next slide. So for a while, when I came from school, I couldn't speak. Um, and it took me a while to figure that out, but while I was trying to tell the story about being undocumented, being in removal proceedings, about a failing school, almost almost failed school, um, I was very depressed. I had gone through a lot of sexual violence. It was just like this perfect storm of terrible things that had happened to me in school. But I was the lucky one, right? I went to school for free. A lot of undocumented folks don't go to school at all, right? And it was hard for me to tell that story, so what I started doing was doodling. Um, I just doodled, any kind of doodle. I did pen doodles paint doodles, um, marker doodles, um, com combinations. This is the one I'm wearing. Um, and a lot of them, uh, you know, I'm starting to use the doodles now for a lot of different projects. I have like 200 of them, but a lot of them were made a very long time ago when I couldn't put words together. Um, and this is sort of where I started finding my voice again was just doodling. Next. Um, and then I knew that I wanted to write a book. I wanted to be a writer, right? I wanted to be somebody with a book out. Um, and I knew that that wasn't just about writing, it was also about having a persona of a writer. So I said, even if I can't say things, I have to have a book out so I can have a persona of a writer. So I wrote this book called um, There's a Truth and There's Other Things. And it's a lot of like multimedia inside um, Next. 
So like an example of it is just, this is just a selfie with a doodle and it has the words around it that say, um, it's always, I don't know how to speak than death. Um, and this was something I was noticing where a lot of people who I had noticed who had either passed away physically or you know their soul just died or socially they just disappeared from spaces, the precursor to that is that they stopped speaking, right? Or we stopped listening to them. And for me, I realized that like I knew not speaking was death, but in some ways like speaking was death as well. Um, so I was sort of put in this conundrum. Um, so I was like, oh, how do I write and not write? How do I speak and not speak? So this was sort of my attempt at that. Next. Um, I'm gonna read one, a poem from that book real quick. All right, these don't have names. <laughs> <It's>, um, <coughs> How do you tell someone that in a different life they died and you wish to see them again and here you both are acting like family isn't a small miracle? What if this life is the wish of another us in another place where things aren't as good? We take for granted, but every time I explain, you call me evil for knowing too much. But isn't that a demon? Someone who gives you spoilers about how it all ends? Luckily for you, we're here in this time Thankful that the other us wished on a rabbit's foot, and it worked. Every ugly piece of that dead thing. Uh, that's just the poem that I wrote. <laughs> we'll see what that's about. <laughs> um, next. All right, so my second book is called I'm Not Allowed to Explain, Only Foreshadow and Reminisce. A lot of this book was about um, interpersonal violence, sexual violence, um, depression, Things that are, don't have to be about being undocumented, but um, a lot of the reasons why I couldn't speak out or leave the situation I was in is because I was undocumented. Um, and they were about me being black and being femme and being queer, and I don't know how to separate those things. Um, so yeah, and it's like, I don't know how to explain this, but I'm just gonna say the thing, right? And you guys can take it how you want. Um, and you can see the doodles are making their way back, but I tried intentionally in this book not to, um, not to put any images inside the book itself, to just let myself write, force myself to write. So now we went from doodles to sort of mixed images to like poetry. Um, I'm not gonna read anything because of time, I'm not gonna read anything, but the first um, video that we watched was from that, it was from that. Awesome, next. And this, I love this image. If you wanna have a sticker of this, if y'all want, but this is my couch. Um, and I just, I love this image, it feels so spiritual. Um, and yeah, you can read the book if you want. I also have copies. Next. 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 These are all from the second book. Okay. And then so between the first book and the second book, uh, my friends and I started a magazine um, because we wanted to be published and we weren't getting published. So we were like, you know what, we're starting our own magazine. Um, and I'm an editor for the magazine, but and I design for the magazine, but my favorite part is just getting in because I'm the one who reviews what gets in. <laughs> Um, so this is um, a piece. So now we're at the pr we're now we're at prose, right? We went from doodles to mixed media to poetry. Now this is me trying to put literal sentences together, um, and this is called my mother's shirt. That's my mother's shirt. Uh, that's my shirt. My mother's voice is a mixture of elation and accusation as it echoes through the sunlit kitchen, sending ripples through my chai. At first, I pretend I don't hear her. It's both a skill I've perfected since moving back home after graduating from a very white college and a symptom of being traumatized by the experience. She's right. I look down at the off-white tunic with short sleeves and long torso. At a glance, the texture looks rough like the sight of a discarded idea. To the touch, it's a soft fabric, the likes of which I've never encountered elsewhere. Intricate holes depicting flowers dance along the trim, it hangs off my frame with a simple elegance I've learned to embrace since puberty came and left me without sufficient breasts. I wanna say she gifted me the shirt, but here's the truth, I stole it. 12 years of rebuilding a life in Massachusetts after arriving from Kenya and overseeing our visa, my family moves to California to pursue an asylum case. My parents leave our home in the middle of the night, hoping to return to the dream one day. The shirt is a casualty. I find it while doing laundry one afternoon last summer while in town interning for the mayor's office. It's in good company, in an old suitcase with other relics that barely survived my family's quest for stability. Immediately, the shirt conjures images of my mother when we first landed in America in February of 2001, with my brother and me in tow, both of us bald-headed, gap-toothed, and wide-eyed. 
Although it is dusty and stale, it feels warm on my skin. I do not call my mother in California to ask if I can keep the shirt. If she loves it, how could she have left it behind? What is the rule for things left behind by family as they chase stability in this treacherous dreamscape? Can we automatically claim their losses as our gains? I'm desperate for my own anchors, so I take it. Now, I have graduated from a very white college, and regrettably, my family comes to visit only during graduation weekend. In my four years there, I often struggle to explain why I'm from. My peers do not understand the nuance of migration patterns and identity. They cannot fathom how I am both black and undocumented, how I am African and queer, or at the very least, how I am an East Coaster with a California address. During my senior year, my toughest year, having the shirt helps. However, I still defer on my post-grad plans for a year home with my family for my mental health. Sihio Nishatiangu, she repeats in Swahili. Her voice is still stern, but she walks past me to prepare for her day because, like me, she's learned to pick her battles. Immediately, I take a defensive stance, not ready to let go of this token I have rebranded for my survival. I found it in the basement of the old house. You don't wear it anymore, I say without lifting my head. It doesn't mean it's not mine or that I don't want it. On instinct, I rise and I begin to pivot out of the kitchen before she can ask for it back. My legs cannot outrun the reach of her words. When we moved to California, I never even went back to collect my things. There it is again, forbidden reflections of a journey where we are never allowed to look back, an asterisk to our progress. Inside, I protest. I am too young and too broken to carry these truths with her. I want the shirt and not the pain that comes with it. I try to sneak away before she launches into a monologue about all that we've lost in this war with America. I feel bad for not wanting to listen, but she ends the encounter the same way she always does. One day, I'm going to tell you something, Gago, she says. One day, I'm going to tell you about myself and where I'm from, and all of this will make sense. Her words scare me. She only says them when I'm close to giving up. I remember them as a 4.0 senior in high school when I could not get into college due, my due to my lack of status. My parents were so distraught, they almost moved us back to Kenya. I heard them again when I broke down and had tried to explain why I was so heartbroken when I returned home from school, the only school that would accept me, even though they did not support me there. I felt the words then as I babbled on about the girls that I half loved and the boys who half loved me, how I no longer felt smart and how confusing the world had become. I hear them every time we move unexpectedly, every time our case is delayed. We both know her words will conform my worst fear and solidify a world she does not want to gift me. The sheer curtains billow into the room, revealing a spotless California sky. I relish in the fact that this is arguably the closest to Kenya we've been in years. The, farthest west, the farther west we move, the farther we are from my mother's mother. Somehow the climate and the vegetation become more familiar to that of the house two miles north of the equator where we lived in the early 90s. There is no winter here like the harsh February night when we arrived in Boston and my mother was wearing a shirt. On most days, I can't decide if this is a silver lining or a cruel joke. Finally, I scurry out of her sight to the refuge of my sister's double-decker bed. To my mother, I must have looked like a limbless, off-white ghost dis disappearing around the corner, a physical manifestation of how the shirt eluded her once before. I sigh in relief. At the very least, I have one more day being an angsty diaspora queer with all the reason, at the wor uh, all the reason to be mad at the world. One more day wearing my mother's clothes without carrying her sorrows. She lets me slip away. Thank you. And then next, um, and then next. So next up, I'm gonna try writing a novel. Um, Javier actually said, if um, if you write things as fiction or poetry, then they can't arrest you. So I'm gonna try that. Um, and then hopefully, um, yeah, you guys will see a fiction project from me soon. Thank you. Hi there, buenas noches. I'm vaccinated. Um, buenas noches, un placer estar aquí. This is so cool. I'm honestly, I'm voy a poner toda chillona and stuff. Um, you know what? I feel like it's so amazing to be part of a community of like badass, talented writers that have embodied this experience because for so many years, 
we were just the subject, and it was kind of annoying, because like, girl, we're not like that, but okay. Um, so it's really amazing, and the fact that we're so diverse in our voices, I think really showcase the fact that, you know, the immigrant experience is, is big and broad, and you know, it, it's not just one thing, and I'm so happy that we're all working within our sector, so, you know, I wish, you know, we all deserve to win, and I'm super excited to, you know, that we are gonna win, and we're gonna make it, we're gonna continue. Now there's a canon of all these undocumented writers. You can go teach a class, and you don't have to teach a white lady teaching about us, okay? Um, unless she's undocumented white people. There's undocumented white people, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> I've seen them, I've met them. Um, pero es un placer estar aquí. Mi nombre es Yosima Reyes. Um, I am originally from the state of Guerrero, Mexico, Southern Mexico. Um, that's why I tell people that I'm cute, short, and dark. Um, and then I was raised in Eastside San Jose, so no muy lejos de aquí. Um, y que más, que más? Yeah, um, I migrated to the United States in 1991. So I came here at three years old. So I came when Governor Pete Wilson was popping um, and he didn't like us. We were like America's worst nightmare. Um, and it was interesting being undocumented in the 90s because I feel like a lot of the talking points that we develop in like 2001 and the early 2000s regarding undocumented subjects uh, were like people thinking that we lived in the 90s. Undocumented people were scared. And I'm so glad it's 2022 because now you will get dragged if you're out here talking about us without inviting us to the function. Uh, so um, yeah, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to witness, you know, I have DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, an executive order signed by Obama in 2012 that grants me the legal authorization for work for two years. Every two years, I pay the government $495, and they gave me this permit to pay taxes. Um, but I'm so happy that now um, all my friends who are undocumented are winning and thriving and breaking through these adversities. And it sucks that we still have to do that, but it's just amazing to see. So, you know, I like to say that all my crushes are undocumented, which works against my original plan in life. Um, because citizens are just underwhelming sometimes. <laughs> all you got, what do you got? Papers? Uh, so, <laughs> pero I'm gonna read a little bit about um, how we got here. Um, I recently moved back to San Jose because of the pandemic. Um, and I'm going to take care of my abuelita. She's between 86 and 90. So ya está grande la señora. Um, but it's been amazing to return back. And mi abuelita's undocumented too. Um, and it's been amazing to go back and kind of be listening to her. Um, peleando con mi abuelita. It looks like elder abuse. Uh, <laughs> but she's amazing. I'm really inspired by that. You know, I, when, I was, when I started writing, I used to be so like thinking that I could do, have an impact. And I want, you know, especially as undocumented writers, we get like kind of coerced to be activists and write Dream Act poems. And honestly, I don't care about the Dream Act no more. <laughs> I realized that what I care about is my grandma. Like, that's all I care about. I don't have the capacity for policy. I don't have the capacity to, I don't have the capacity for legislation. I don't. The only thing I have capacity is that my grandma lives the best life and they honor her here that I take care of her in a country that wanted to destroy her. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm home con mi abuelita, um, dressing her up in her outfits, you know, cause she's podonga sometimes. Um, so this is, how, and she's the one that brought me here. Um, Mama Doña did not trust men. After eight hours on a bus, we arrived in Tijuana. She unboarded holding our hands and keeping a watch for us. Mi abuelo staggered behind because he had a going, going away party before coming, so he's making the journey north hungover as fuck. There were five of us, Selene, Kika, Bebe, Pelon, and me. Mama Noya's mission is to cross all of us to my mom and my tia. My cousin, way lighter than Pelon and me, are about to embark in a journey all different from ours. Usted va pal norte, a fat, sweaty dude asks as he observes Mama Doña with all her kids. Si, sí, Mama Doña hesitates, hesitates at answering. Vaya a este hotel y ahí le van a llegar unos coyotes para decirle cómo vamos a pasar. The man hands her a piece of paper with a hotel name and instructs her to wait. Mama Doña takes us to the hotel. She locks the door behind. She is scared thinking about the dangers of crossing with five young children. Abuelo snores on the bed as we all play luchadores, jumping and tackling each other. She steps outside and finds a pay form, which she calls my tío Juan, my cousin's dad, who's paying to cross us. Juan, tengo miedo. Estos hombres están bien gordos y tienen la cara de malos. ¿Qué pasa si me roban a los niños? ¿Por qué no me buscas una mujer, una coyota para que nos pase? 
Coyote is a nickname given to white people who are given to what white people who are about laws and alleged morality call human smugglers. To, to us, coyotes are actually guys that take us to meet our loved ones, guys that know a way around the desert and cross us to a new life. But much like the nature of the actual coyote, one must be aware that they are tricksters and often are quick to turn on you or leave you to fend for yourself. Trust and instinct are important when you are to cross to the other side. Mama Doña, who has made it far in life by trusting her intuition, knows that she needs a woman to cross her. Usted va para el norte, a woman approaches her. Sí, pero tengo miedo, Mama Doña explains. Yo la paso, the woman tells her. ¿De veras? Pero como le hago? Esos hombres me están esperando. Mama Doña, Mama Doña stares at a group of men huddled at the corner of the hotel. Dígales que soy su hija y que mejor ya no va a cruzar, que yo me la voy a llevar a la casa. Abuela rushes to the room and instructs us to gather our belongings. We are unaware of what's happening. Before coming, Mama Doña explained that we're about to visit our parents. We are filled with adrenaline knowing that we're about to hug them. I am young and I don't remember my mom's face, but my brother's joy is contagious, so I know the journey will be worth it. We arrive in the Hotel Vagabundo. Mama Doña fills the, ba the bathtub with warm water. After a day of traveling, we are all ecstatic about being able to play in the water. We jump into the tub in our underwear as mi abuela sorts out the te details with the coyota. Pues, a los güeritos los podemos cruzar por la línea. La coyota explains that since my cousins are fair-skinned, they can cross to the line, meaning that we'll travel with someone else's birth someone else's birth certificate as they pretend to fall asleep in the back of the car. It's safer for them because they won't have to cross the desert. Or fortunately for us, prietos, we are too dark to pass as US citizens, so we have to make the journey on our own two feet. Mama Doña is horrified at the idea of being separated, especially at the fact that Kika and Selene are little girls. Bebe is too young to defend them, but he ha she has to trust and let them go. Dios Santo, por favor, cuídame a estos niños, que nada les pase, te los dejo en tus manos. The journey is seven days. We are instructed to wear dark clothes, stay close to each other, and to not make noise. Since I am the baby, everyone in the group is hesitant to cross with us. A baby is a risk. There is no control of a child's emotions, so crossing with one can often be why we get caught. Abuela makes up a game. She ties her long skirt at my wrist so I can feel the tug if I fall behind. She tells me we're playing Las Escondidas, a game where you hide and don't tell anyone to where to find you. The desert is black, and so are my memories from then on. Um, <laughs> so we cross. <laughs> this is mi abuelita telling me the story of why we crossed this. And mi abuelita is, es mira chismosa, you know? She's definitely a fiction writer, so you know, you're like, oh girl, that's a metaphor. I don't know if that's factual, but I don't know if I can trace it. You know the beautiful thing about being undocumented is you make shit up and oh, girl, what, you're gonna doubt it? There's no public record. Uh, <laughs> I dare you. Uh, we crossed in 1991, we llegamos a unos apartamentos, and at the time they didn't say check social security numbers. So that apartment complex was an ice hot spot. Um, because all my neighbors were undocumented. Oftentimes you hear the narrative like, oh, I was the only one. But you, those mis vecinos were undocumented. And it was beautiful growing up in a neighborhood. So that's why it was very interesting when I started seeing narratives about who we were because it looked like we were just, we just needed people saving. And the reality is that we've existed since the early 90s. We knew where to hire us. We know who make the micas. We know like all the, we have different businesses. And I think that for me was like more insulting. The fact that when we look at undo undocumented subjects, there's this kind of like racial McCollin, like we, you know, saving the dogs. Uh, which is insulting because to be undocumented and to survive 5, 10, 15, 25, 30 years in this country, it takes a, it takes a certain level of genius. Um, so I think that's why when I talk to undocumented people, I'm like, bro, you're a genius. Honestly, just write that in your application. I am a genius. I am undocumented. <laughs> I get all the funds. Um, but oh, this next one, we grew up in an apartment complex. I like to write messy immigrant stories because my grandma's messy and I'm messy and I like think messiness is universal. I think we, um, I feel like, you know, when we did the symbol that we're monarch butterflies, I'm like, oh no, we're more like cucarachas, you know, like, you know, ice raid, INS raid, cucaracha raid, like, I don't know, there's a deep metaphor there. 
Uh, so this is the story. We got here, it was really hard, porque uh, we grew up poor. No sabíamos, you know, we don't, you don't come with money. We grew up poor. So mi abuelita, you tell her right now, I wrote this story about how she was shoplifting. It's like, no, no digas eso. She thinks she's going to get deported because of this story. I was like, girl, <laughs> you're going to deport her for other things, not this story. Okay, go. <laughs> Ma'am, we got you on camera. A pack and save security tells Mama Doña. Mama Doña, unable to communicate, stares at a small TV where the security guard plays a video in which she is vividly putting two containers of Tylenol in her coat pocket. Hey kid, can you translate for her? The, the security guard, the security officer directs his attention towards me. Abuelita, dice el señor que está robando. <laughs> I quickly explained to Mama Doña as she cannot deduct by, by now what is happening. The truth is Mama Doña takes pride in the fact that she's not a thief. Unfortunately, for a lot of poor Mexicans, we have this orgullo thing about not being rateros, which does not translate to Mexican politicians because they have no issue with that. Since no one will hire Mama Doña because of her lack of English, old age, and just plain stubbornness to learn American customs, she made friends with our neighbor Chonita. Chonita lives in apartment 17, and she has so many kids, rumor has it that the government pays her rent. Her kids are loud and wild. Often you hear them shouting, fuck you, bitch, in the courtyard as they play. Chonita, with her, Chonita, with her stroller in her arm, takes a can of Pepsi, Diet Pepsi and pours it into the baby's biberon. The kids fight for what is left over, but she smacks their hands and chucks the rest. You would imagine that Chonita is a young mother and her lack of parenting skills comes from her inexperience, but Chonita is 40, so you would be left to wonder at what age she started to have all these babies. Está bien fácil, doña. Solo te vistes con una chamarra grande y, una, y caminas como si estás viendo las cosas. Después discretamente pones lo que quieras en tus bolsas y para que no sospechen, vas al registro y compras un chicle. Chonita trains Mama Doña how to shoplift. Her kids have this operation down. As soon as we walk through the store, they scatter like cucarachas. One goes for the cookies, another for the candy, another for the soda. Chonita walks acting unknowingly, shuffling envelopes full of wig coupons. The kids follow her, throwing their items on the bottom of the stroller. Chonita acts like she doesn't see them. Abuela walks to the medicine, medicine aisle. Papatino is hung over and has been complaining about headaches all week. A comadre mentioned that Tylenol might help, so here we are. Unlike Chonita, Mama Doña is an amateur. She wore the most oversized coat she could find, a fur coat she found at the donations at the Juan 316 church. She keeps looking back and forth as if Jesus himself is working loss prevention. We do as Chonita says, and we walk to pay the pack of gum. On the aisle, we hear of the commotion. No, 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 I don't speak English, Chonita shouts at the cashier. Ma'am, we have to search the stroller, the, Shakir, the cashier commands. At this point, the cashier has left the register and has one hand holding the stroller. Chonita's wild kids begin to kick the cashier, and she releases the grip, and they all make a run for it. We watch them take off past us, and we also make a run for it, but by the time we make it outside, they are nowhere to be found. We turn around, and the security says, can you both follow me? Uh, so abuela registered what the officer is saying. She tells me to translate. I pues, Dile que somos pobres y que la medicina y que la medicina es para ti porque te sientes muy mal y no tenemos ni doctores y no tenemos y no tenemos cómo sobrevivir. Mama Doña is a storyteller and I quickly between me and her uh, quickly between her wit and my command of English we build an elaborate story about how I have been suffering from migraines since birth and since we are recent arrivals this is our last resort. The loss prevention officer looks concerned, and so I hit them with my sad, desperate eyes. Are you gonna deport my abuela and send me to foster care? The officer's sternness softens, and he lets us go with a warning. Abuela and I never set foot in a pack and save again. <laughs> my abuelita is so ratchet. Honestly, I love that old lady so much. Like, honestly, I, she's so cute. Um, and it's really interesting these, during COVID because I've tried to like put her on Instagram. I have made her a Facebook. Now she's Facebook famous. Um, y luego dice, a ver, ¿qué me dicen mis comentarios? I have to read it for her. She has a mural here at, at Claron Alley in the Mission. You can see her. And then we, um, uh, an artist painted her and they just bought it at the, for the permanent collection at the San Jose Art Museum, uh, which is so dope. We're gonna be part of that. Um, and I think that's, that's what I'm more proud of that like, you know, that I can 
I don't, you know, for me, is I don't care about the attention. I want my family to feel honored and feel valued and, and, and to celebrate my abuela because she deserves it. So this one's um, called Summer. Um, we grew up hella poor. And my abuelita was like annoyingly la señora que vendía todo. And so she started recycling bottles and cans, which was like, you know, I, I was, I don't know if you've seen the novela Teresa growing up in Televisa. I was the Teresa of my family, clearly. Uh, and I would like, it was so bad because I was, I don't know how I became high maintenance, but I was like, uh, this is good. I was, are you probably, uh, you know, a la mejor me robaste cuando mis papás eran ricos y por eso nací así. Uh, so this is my abuelita. Abuela wakes up at eight. It's Saturday morning and the most kids are up at this hour watching cartoons. Abuela has breakfast served for me. The sun is already blazing and slowly taking over the streets of Eastside San Jose. After we are done drinking our cafe con bolillo, we head out the door and I follow abuela as she picks up a shopping cart that will help her for the day. We begin walking down the street. She pulls the shopping cart from the front as I lean my arms pushing through the back. The wind blows her lime white hair and imagine she's a river, a powerful body of water that carried me here. She looks back back at me. In our wrinkled face, there's a sweet smile. I smile back, and though I begin to get frustrated that the sun is beating against my skin, I say nothing because she's always taught me to be grateful for the light of day. We stop at a big green house. The grass is neatly trimmed, and the windows are crystal clear. Abuela makes her way to the back of the house, and I take a break and sit under a bush for shade. We come back. She comes back carrying a trash can filled with bottles, her small body bending as she struggles to pour them into our cart. I run to help her, but she tells me to stay put, that I'm too small, I might get hurt. As we go from house to house, I watch her repeat this routine, the sun increasing in its intensity. The houses on this block are beautifully painted, surrounded by rose bushes and the silence that takes over the street. Um, I imagine what it must be like to live in a place where there's no noise, where everything rests in its proper place. I begin to dream of the day when I will be old enough to buy a house. I want a big room for my abuelitos, a space for my brother, and one for me. As we continue walking, I see kids playing in their front yards. They pass a ball around, and as soon as they stare or look at me, they stop and stare. Their eyes look at me like I'm something strange. By this point, my cart is filled with so many bottles that the rattling takes over the street. Abuela pulls the cart with force, and for some reason, I freeze. A slow fire begins to burn in the pit of my belly, and the blazing sun helps it turn into rage. Out of nowhere, I get mad. I want to stop pushing this stupid cart and run home. My mind begins to will up with all these questions that I know are impolite to ask. Abuela turns back and sees me standing there. She shouts, Gordo, apurate. I look at her, and she can see the anger in my eyes. She knows this rage. She knows this fire. She stops pushing the shopping cart and walks towards me. ¿Qué tienes, mijo? I ask her, why don't you have a real job? Why do we have to come to look through people's trash cans? Why can't we have a house? She wipes the sweat from her brow. She rests her hand on her waist and looks down at me. Pues mira, mijo. Ya no estamos en México. Las cosas son diferentes aquí. Yo no soy muy, yo estoy muy vieja para entender muchas cosas. Yo no tengo tu inteligencia, pero yo sé que no siempre vamos a tener que trabajar así. I look back at her, her dark skin shining against the sun. I want to be a big tree and have my shadow protectors from these feelings of shame. Tears begin to well up in my eyes, and I become mad at myself for being mad at her. She grabs my hand. Andale, ya vámonos. Cuando vendamos estas botellas, te voy a comprar algo. We walk back toward the cart and begin to push again. Our rattling presence echoes through the silent neighborhood. Uh, I know that's tragic. Um, so I think for me, one of the biggest things when I was growing up, I, when I was 16, it was very difficult um, because I was just going through it. I'm 16, I'm very Americanized, I speak English, I love books. I'm growing up in the living room porque mi abuelita rentaba los cuartos to day laborers. Uh, my grandparents are recycling bottles and cans. My grandpa's an alcoholic. I'm undocumented. I'm poor. There's roaches everywhere. And on top of that, I'm gay. I'm like, oh my God, que mal. Like, girl, Jesus, give me a sign. But I, <laughs> girl, oh my God, if, if oppression was the Olympics, baby, I'm, I'm runner up. Okay, I am though. Um, pero one of the beautiful things that happened was that I had writing and I started writing those things and I think what happens with a lot of writers, I went to San Francisco State, uh, I got accept I only applied to two schools, San Jose State, San Francisco State, but I knew how to live the hood in order for me to get away from all of that and I'm so happy I did. I went to San Francisco State and I was majoring in English, you know, we have an amazing Latino studies program, but I'm like, girl, I'm Latino studies, I don't gotta study that. 
Uh, and I, w I went in English, and it's just like in the movies, you know, I was like the, the Philly Brown of the class, uh, the chola in the back writing about being an Aztec goddess. Uh, and so it was very amazing to be in that because I witnessed the fact that a lot of the people in my cohort of writers, they want, they were, there's this myth that the writer has to go chasing the story. Oh, I gotta go to a different country, or I gotta go chase the story. And I realized I don't have to do that. All I gotta do is look in the mirror. All I gotta do is listen to my abuela. So I just started really typing the stories that my tias or my abuelas were saying. And then, you know, they give you feedback in the writer's workshop. If you're like, oh my God, how'd you come up with that character? I'm like, girl, she's so complex. I'm like, that she is, girl. And I know they started talking about my characters like they were piñatas. And I'm like, girl, uh, I'll finish with this um, because I think this is um, really beautiful. Um, I think the other thing that poverty taught me was like the magic that it takes to create something. And mi abuelita was amazing because um, we were so poor, but she always made it happen. She always made it work. If I wanted shoes, she made it work. Like it just worked. Uh, one of the most beautiful memories, I read about my abuelito and I'm writing a book that I'm exploring him too. I read my abuelito, he passed away, he self-deported. Um, and, um, and I loved him. He was an alcoholic, but he loved us so much. He loved us so much to put up with this country. Um, and so one of the, my fondest memories of my abuelito is, you know, they used to do those Toys R Us commercials, and we always wanted the Toys R Us toys, but girl, we were more like Goodwill toys. Um, but my abuelito one time, and there was no map quest back then, so I was like, I want to go to Toys R Us, to the toy store. And my abuelito, we rode the bus for like eight hours trying to find a Toys R Us, and we didn't find it. But it was just the idea of him being tired and just taking me around finding the Toys R Us. It's like a metaphor to what our parents do for us. Like, they'll do anything. And so for that, I'm really grateful. And it's sad that we, in this country, we celebrate youth and we talk about dreamers and all of that. And there's nobody talking about elders and how so many of them are choosing to die here or returning home and die missing us. And so um, this is what I wrote. My abuela used to keep old VH tapes. Mi tío René, who died of cancer in Mexico, used to send to us. These old tapes were the only images I had at Mexico. In the films, they used to capture dirt roads, our town, old relatives would send their regards. Abuela would smile with tears in her eyes. She treasured these videos, and every time someone from our town would visit, she would request for us to play them. I found it silly that she found so much joy watching a movie with no plot. I am sure if Abuela would read, she would be a total Virginia Woolf, because that bitch had no plot. The, <laughs> the day my abuelo chose to self-deport, he wanted to be known that this country did not kick him out. He wanted to be known that he left on his own accord with his head held up high. You know, like when you're drunk off your ass getting kicked out the club and you say, fuck it, I didn't want to be here anyways. That day was like a funeral. We gathered at my abuela's house. Relatives and my parientes came to say their goodbyes. We packed two vans, and on the 280 North, we began the procession to watch abuelo depart from SFO. At the airport, we all walked abuelo to the TSA line with tears in our eyes, watched him smile because he was finally returning home. We must have looked ridiculous to the folks running to catch their flight, a group of dark Mexicans crying like we're never gonna see this old man again. I want you to drop strangers and explain to them, you don't get it, Once we don't have papers, once this flight takes off, all we have is hope. It was announced that through DACA, I could apply to a special permit called advanced parole, in which I allowed me to return to my home country for humanitarian purpose, they had a relative dying, employment, if I was hired to do a job for educational purpose, I took advantage of this opportunity and then I applied to an educational program called Dreamers Without Borders, talk about a groundbreaking title. I applied, <laughs> I applied not expecting much from it, but to my surprise, I received an email from Jali congratulating me. I was accepted. I couldn't believe it. I got the golden ticket to return home. For so many undocumented people, our home countries become a mythical place, something you cannot touch. Our home countries are fragments of old VHS tapes, anecdotes, pictures, letters. Our imagination collages this together, and through Google Earth, we imagine what it must be like to walk through our town. I was excited to leave this country. Lord knows, after 27 years of living under, uh, under constant xenophobia, a bitch needs a piña colada 
Ibarra in Acapulco. I was super excited because, but in the back of my mind, my, my shady ass was telling myself to set realistic expectations for poor immigrants like me. We got to keep it real. You can't dream too big because life will humble you. Look at Selena. She won the Latin Grammy and look how that movie ended. I'm telling you, you can't get too excited. I, I got excited, accepted in June 2016, and just like I told you, what happened in November 2016, we elected Trump into office. When I was watching the 2016 elections, at first I was like, okay, I get it that this country doesn't like us, but I mean, we can't be that bad. Once it was announced that he was president, I was like, damn, y'all really hate us. I was scheduled to leave the country the first week of December, but after the election, I placed everything on hold. But deep down inside, I knew I had to go like Maury in those episodes where people are forced to confront their fears and phobia. I felt like I had to just jump in, face the fear of never returning. For my own sanity, I could no longer live with a what if. I hated the fact that in my head, I equated returning home with a death sentence. I went, I went, I went against my advice of my, uh, of my friends and I took a plane to Mexico City. I was so mad when I found out that it was a two hour and 30 minute flight. Here I am thinking I'm on a quest to the moon when that shit is shorter than going to fucking Portland. <laughs> Mexico City is amazing. I hate that they didn't teach us about how ancient we are. Mexico City got pyramids next to the fucking Walmart. What do we got here? A drive through Taco Bell. The drive to Atoyac is two hours from Acapulco. I stay vigilant of my surroundings because I know all I know about Guerrero is how dangerous it is. The bus moves from town to town. In my head, I see pictures of headlines of the people of people who have gone missing. September 26, 2014, 43 male students from Ayotzinapa Rural Teacher School were virtually abducted and disappeared. The, pass, the bus passes town after town. We arrive at Atoyac. Mi tia picks me up. We drive to her house. My grandfather is waiting for me anxiously. It's been three years since I've last seen my grandfather. In the United States, he's made his life unbearable, our life unbearable with his drinking. He would, a I would ask him, ¿Por qué tomas tanto, abuelito? Es que quiero irme a mi tierra. Mijo, I ignored his depression and made in my mind that his longing to return was another excuse for him not to wanting to be an up. Siéntate, mijo, vamos a platicar. The moon and stars are brightly lit. The sound of grasshoppers takes over the street. I turn to my abuelo, his old body swinging back and forth in a hammock. In the United States, he used to sleep in the living room couch. In all his time there, he never knew what a belt felt like. The night is hot. I let a bed sheet and fall asleep as I pray, please God, don't let me get stuck here. Before leaving Mexico, Abuelo walks me to the car and takes me to the airport. He folds 200 pesos into my hand. Mijo, you're smart. Find, if there's, find out if there's a way I can come back to you all. I promise, I'll do better this time. Muchas gracias, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, let's hear it again for all three, uh, all three poets. Very great. Uh, we did, we did want to um, spend just a, a short time here with like a Q and A session. So um, I'm gonna set up some chairs. If you if you could join me in the front, uh, Yossi, uh, Gladys, and and Javi. And um, wow, that was kind of mind blowing. <laughs> all the uh, all the different uh, readings and styles. Um, we did want to begin with a question uh, that we ended with uh, last um, yesterday, uh, which was a question from the audience about um, why poetry, right? And I guess I'll add to that question and say because I know uh, Javi, you have a memoir memoir coming out. Uh, and you, you know, you read from a lot of storytelling, uh, kind of creative nonfiction. And then Gladys, you mentioned the uh, the novel, right? like a novel. Uh, was it uploading, loading? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe like why this, you know, why begin with poetry? What you know, what was it that drew you to poetry, and then a shift now to to more maybe more narrative. Um, um, poetry. I don't know. Like I, I wasn't documented when I fucking started writing, and poetry is cheap. <laughs> you just need a pen and a paper. I wanted to be 
a musician first. I can't read music for shit. Then I wanted to be a painter. Paint is expensive, and I, I didn't really like it. I'm a good drawer, or I was. And then poetry was the cheapest thing, but also you only need to write one page to feel good. That poem could o could be a two line, two lines. And I think when you, the world is crumbling around you, and you're, I began to write when I was 17. And it was the year after, I was like, oh shit, I can't get a driver's license, it's gonna be hard for me to go to college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the pen made me feel good, but it also helped me process. I think if you have, now I could only write prose until I got a fucking green card. Like I didn't start writing prose until 2018 when I, I got a, a, a green card. And I think that's very telling. Um, regarding the privileges. Um, I had healthcare at the time. I don't have healthcare right now. Um, but I, I was at a stable at the time, fellowship. And so all those things gave me the literal privilege and time to sit down and write more than one page at a time. So, yeah. Uh, I think you have yet. I started writing poetry in high school. I was going through it, like it was just so hard. Um, it just, it was just so hard. I remember um, I was walking home from school and then across the street, I saw my abuelito pushing this huge cart filled with bottles and I could have run across the street to help him, but I didn't because all my, the students that I went to school with were coming out of high school, so they were gonna see me. And I remember that shame of like, and that guilt of like, why am I embarrassed of that labor? Um, and I think every, all of us who grew up Americanized grew up with, embarrassment or shame or poverty. And poverty is not cute, it's violent. And so I just remember having being angry. I was just so angry because it wasn't fair. Like how is it fair? Like it's un, I'm just as capable, I have the same talents and I, it's just not fair. Um, but then shout out to the English teachers because I think English teacher, the, my English teacher was my, she was not even my teacher. She was just, um, she was like, oh, I want to start a poetry club. And she started a poetry club and I wrote a poem about my grandpa recycling. And you know, like a lot of, I know sometimes when you write poems like that, a lot of, it's a lot of poverty porn. People love to hear. Uh, <laughs> but one of the beautiful things that came out of that was that I started performing and speaking in public. I started, I do speak out of here. Um, it was one of the first stages that I set foot in and I started learning, you speak, yeah. Oh, awesome, yeah, it's a great, you, yeah. It's such a great organization that teaches young people literacy. Um, and I got to perform like in front of like a huge auditorium to people. Um, and then that's how I started poetry. And then I realized like I can just say whatever and people were like, oh my God, it's amazing. Uh, and you're cute, you're an immigrant. And then I did a lot of Spanglish, so that you so And now I wanna do more short stories, I see, because I felt like for so long immigrant undocumented narratives are how like good we are and how noble and giving we are, which we are. But we're also really messy. There's that senora chismosa. There's like the girl that scammed, you know. And we should be allowed to be all that. Like I don't want to be honorable all the time. Um, so I think for me, like now with with short story and reading, writing about my vecinos and my neighbors, I get to explore the impact of all of that. Like yes, we're good people and we're here to work, but we have to do what we gotta do to get by. And I know a lot of people look down on, you know, getting a fake social y todo es madre, but that's how people make it. Like, how do you think we're surviving? Why do you think there's an I-10 number for us? Like, people know that we're working. Um, so I wanna like break this idea that we're just like cute little butterflies. We're cucarachas. <laughs> um, yeah, I think poetry is so important. Um, as an, a, a writing teacher, an English teacher, wh what I'm teaching my students is not what I wanna be teaching my students. And um, as someone who comes from a place that was colonized by the English, like I have a lot of feelings about English and teaching English and how colonial and imperial that is. But poetry, I think there's a lot of freedom in poetry. And I always try to find opportunities for my students to be creative. Um, but I think for myself, I started off as a journalist um, in high school. I started another publication in high school. That's my thing, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm scamming. Scamming in these streets. But um, I started off as a journalist and I have this poem that I wrote recently that was like, 
I used to be a journalist. Now I write li lists in my journal. Um, and because I couldn't talk about myself, I remember interviewing people anonymously about being undocumented, and that was my first like writing thing. And I remember not wanting to use my own story or not wanting to talk about myself um, because that was risky, and I didn't want to be political. Like we're so we're forced into so many political nar narratives. And it's funny that you mentioned the governor because like when I was a kid. I was obsessed with Mitt Romney, um, and I was trying to figure out why, this is totally a tangent, but I was trying to figure out why I was obsessed with Mitt Romney, and it's because he was the governor of Massachusetts when I was a kid. And as undocumented people, we're so, we know so much politics. Like, I studied politics in college, and I was like, I'm running, like, running circles around these kids, because we just know politics inherently. Um, but I think the freedom is in poetry, and I also, another thing I realize is, um, I have another poem that says, I'm not a poet, I just got the most poetic version of this life. Like there's just, there's so much magic all the time and, and we try to like explain it, but if you just write it the way it is, it's just poetry. Um, and I think we should just lean into that a lot more. Everybody should. It's interesting, you know. I, it's interesting, I feel you know, like because I feel like I've been telling the same story all the time. I've been trying to explain my memoir, so there's like chapters or like oh, I feel like I'm like dude. I feel like I'm like dude. I probably erased something from my file, and then I talk to my and then I talk to my mom or like my mom my mom or like oh no, that's not how it happened. That's not how I remember it. But it's, everybody's had a different version. So right now, all I'm trying to do, yeah, I've been in my process of writing is interviewing them. Um, and trying to get, ultimately, I only write about myself in my experience of them. I know that I can't write my abuelita's story because that's her own, or my mom's story, that's her own thing, but I think I try to capture um, those things. And the other thing that I, I realized is that I also try to, you know, be honest with myself in, in my writing of like the places where I haven't been the best version of myself to my family because everything's family is about relationships. Um, and it just so happens that right now, you know, I'm in a relationship with my abuela, with my family. Most of us are, you know, are, are, don't have status. Um, and we're all trying to make it in this country. So like, I feel like if we were all to write a book, it would be like so, so vastly different. But in anything, I think for me, my voice is, humor is a huge role in the memories that I have. And it's probably a defense mechanism. I probably should talk to a therapist of why I make fun of everything, because uh, it's not good. I'm like, oh, poverty, ha, ha, ha. Um, but I think for me, I like being able that I don't, I think life has been so impactful that by me disarming it through humor, like I can digest it better. And so I think that's why I was telling you that I'm writing, working on my book. I was like, oh, I want it to be like a bunch of undocumented beach tree. Like you go to the beach and you're like, oh my God, they're undocumented and they're messy and they're funny and they're cute. But you know, I, I don't want to write like, I don't know, I could write like that, but I don't want to write that. But right now, yeah, it's been honoring the funny anecdotes or the humor that it take, took us to make it this far. Um, and I think that's really powerful because if you, you know, hang out with us, you probably feel, oh my God, they're laughing at tragedy. But that's how we do it. <laughs> Um, I think I, I thought a lot about this question in my second book, I'm Not Allowed to Explain, Only Foreshadow and Reminisce, because I think there's a lot of this journey that we're not allowed to say in real time. Like, I can't tell you what's happening now, but I can tell you about it in five years, or I can tell you what's gonna happen in five years. But And I think about my family a lot, like they never tell me what's going on, but they'll refer to it later. Or like, we'll be in court and the judge will say something crazy, and I'll be like, what, did that happen? Like. That's not my, that's not what I recall was happening. Um, and I think specific, I mean, this happens for so many other reasons. I think I went through a lot of violent things that were not related to being undocumented and I have trouble recalling that memory. 
and a lot of my poems are me like putting that together in the way that I think it happened and being like, this is my perspective, that's all I can offer. I can't offer what actually happened, I don't know. And I don't know if it's relevant, right? Because the way it gets stuck in our head is the thing that affects us the most. Um, and I, I think it's important to create public record, that's why I write, I want there to be, like if you wanna contest my memory, that's fine, but there has to be a memory to contest. And that's important because if there is no memory to contest, then they can say anything happened. And they can say they didn't do these violent things to us. Um, and I think the final thing I'll say is, you know, it, the, the thing you said about homelands being so mythical, like I think I write so much, I long so much to go home. And it's like a fake place, like whatever I remember, I can't have remembered that much, I was so young. Um, and it's like this beautiful life that I lived or this, you know, things that I'm making up about what happened. And that is that longing, I think, is what made me a writer. Just like longing for something that supposedly happened. Memory is not reliable at all, I'm finding out. <laughs> but thinking that it's memory, and as an immigrant, I think we get to say it's memory, where a lot of people have to write it as fiction. And I love that, where I, I sort of get to transverse that space of memory and and poetry and fiction and at the end of the day, you know, it, it you know, we get the credit and we get to create whatever space we want. Um, for me, I even in like my self critique of my poetry is that having gone through something so traumatic at the short age, my memory tends to cling to the hard the harshness and the difficult. And Going back to the question of prose, in prose, I wanted, and also I wrote the poetry without a therapist. I highly recommend getting a therapist, and I highly recommend getting a therapist that in through which you feel seen. My therapist was a child immigrant from the DR herself, um, and in which she's not a traditional therapist, but she breaks the wall, and like she's not supposed to tell me how we we have similar. Uh, stories about that, stories to me, I find that, honest. Me, I find and honesty has, honesty has been really um, good in good recovering in not only the hard part, part, because my memoir is my takes memoir place over the nine weeks the that I was a nine-year-old nine with nine strangers years coming years to the United States. States. And, that and that has been the trauma that, that I didn't want to remember. And I just began to crack at the surface with the poems. And literally, you look, literally you look at the white page, now I feel it. Feel and that feeling, and that feeling um, is, um, healing. is healing. And at the same time, the same time I, have I have found out to trust out your memory. Trust I used to do this thing, I and I feel like we go at it in a way of like, oh, I that can't be how it that happened. That and for a lot of times, <laughs> like I would have you know, PTSD, the dreams, and then I would go, now that I have a green grid, I would go to the literal spot in the border, and how I remembered it as a kid is how it is in that sector. Because if you, if you go, there are certain cactus that only grow in a certain place. And even as a kid, I remember that. And so over and over through my therapist sessions, my therapist is just, at this point, just trust your gut. And once I, be, I really learned to trust my gut, I could write the whole fucking thing. So I would just remind you if you're trying to, you know, just trust your memory and fuck it. If, you know, that, that is the biggest writer's block when you're, when you're doing that questioning, but eventually you will break, break that questioning and something will break through. Um, experiences and once I quote unquote found some happiness I couldn't write anymore and it's like how you know if it is something that you're passionate about which I am still passionate about like how can you keep being an artist a writer you know knowing that you have that trauma that inspires you but you can still write about happiness I think you yeah, Javier, you talked about like, you know, 
people always say that I talk about, you know, sadness mm -hmm. with me seeing the song. And so like that was like an attempt, but just like to the whole group, like, do you feel inspired to write about happiness? Like I wrote something stupid about Saturday ballet. I've never taken ballet before. <laughs> and the poet laureate made me like sign my poem, mm -hmm. which was a joke. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying like, like that was like an out, out of body experience. Mm -hmm. But how can you keep that and keep it balanced, being authentic, but also have joy? Yeah. We smell flowers. We yeah. do all of those things every day. In addition to also feeling pain and processing our lives. I'm also in therapy. <laughs> like all of us, like artists need therapy yeah. more than anything. More before your paycheck needs therapy. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's a really, I think that's a charge that's really, to me. I think that's a charge to me. I think I write a lot about, about trauma. And trauma. And so I just think on my green card. So I was about to say, like, 20 cards. Got my green card. Shout out to my husband. It's funny you're talking about, like, people with papers are boring, but my husband is an immigrant. It's nothing to be in my act. And I was like, that's so lit. So it worked out. It worked out. He was naturalized. So. And, so and I think it's funny because like I, I there's, there's so many I, poems so that are so beautiful about so being about safe and about being in love and all these things and I'm just like that's not called snap like that's not my brand like people don't expect that from me so I have to give the trauma because that's what the girls want they want drama so um and I struggle with that because I'm like if I feel like I have to mine every single trauma of my life until I can stop which I can go for a while I'd go for like 20 more years of just up until now. Um, but I think um, that's a charge for me. I'm gonna try to do that. I know I tell my students a lot. I give them very simple prompts, like my people are, and just keep repeating that and keep writing that. And those things are just observations. They don't have to do with good or bad. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna take that seriously. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to write some like neutral or happy poems because I don't think that's something I do enough. Uh, for me, I think I, 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 try, to I, I try to touch on that a lot because I feel like I didn't, I, I used to do, when I, you know, when it was when cute I, you know, to be undocumented, it 2012, it was in Vogue, it was popping. Um, you would get invited to do um, all these interviews and commercials, and MTV doing this, VH1, uh, you know, it was cute. I was like, you know, yes. Was and I would say yeah. yes, because in my I mind, my yes, citizen husband would see how articulate I am. It's going to find me on Instagram and DM me, but it didn't happen. Um, but um, I said, but I started I said seeing how, like, undocumented stories was, like, this thing of, like, it was, we were not the audience. We the audience the was audience, this movable middle. Movable and girl, middle. if I have to convince you to like me, I don't really want, want to convince you. Really convince you made your choice already. Um, so then I started um, thinking so like, you know what? I want my audience to be undocumented people. I want the people to read me, be the señoras that I hang out, my abuelita. If there's 11 million of us, if that's the only people that are buying my book, it's gonna be cute. Um, and so that's why I started doing my uh, the thing of like, I wanna make stories about us that are real and honest and messy and complicated and funny. And now I'm so happy because, you know, my biggest accomplishment, we don't live in that neighborhood that we grew up in. My grandma is stable, she has a cute house, she has a garden. Now she's like, oh, what do I do with this? You know, she's now she, she's not on survival mode no more. So now she has to deal with like all these, all these other things. Um, but I was telling her the other day, because what, I, what were we buying? I was buying her like, um, she sleeps in the living room because she, she's like a hood security uh, when she has a room, but she's like, I feel safer watching. Girl, what are you gonna do if they break in? <laughs> um, but I was telling her, I was like, we deserve nice things. And I remember that, we deserve nice things. We deserve nice things. I have to convince her every time I buy her something that she deserves it. Um, and so I think for us, I think so right I think now I'm really us, happy right now, this really reading happy. and I'm happy with this all of us are doing in our sectors that we're, we're all winning and we're all thriving and creating our own avenues. And I think for me, that is inspiring to see my friends winning. I'm like, wow, like, and the fact that I think sometimes like in artists, in the artist world, we get taught that we're in competition with each other, but it's not a competition. Like, bro, like I get to brag about Javier, I get to brag about Gladys, like that's my friend. So I feel like I, I, more of that. And I'm so excited for the future and for us to all be sitting in the same bookshelf one day. So yeah, get more young. <laughs> I think the question, is the, the question is the audience. I write for myself. I write for myself. Um, um, the book of poems, the book for, me. Poems for me. Uh, 
the memoir uh, is for me. Memoir, um, it came out of a prompt. Um, like, what, prompt, what would you tell? I was ignoring that nine-year-old kid that, that was me, kid, and it was like a shadow following me. And I would just like not look at him. So what would it be? What would it look like if I just censored that nine-year-old? And that's what I did. For the next thing, now. That, now, like, the trauma that, like, is done. Trauma, I'm probably never going to write about that because about it, a that. lot of healing has happened. Healing has happened. And, I also, and I also, uh, what I heard in that question was also this myth, myth, myth that we tell ourselves, which I am responsible for. I thought that I had to live in New York City and to be a writer and that I have to be struggling and that, and, and like, et cetera. Like, I would, and I was unhappy. I was just destroying my body. Uh, in, New uh, in New York City because I thought that that's what I had to do. And the pandemic, and if you, pandemic, yeah. if you I think there, we're seeing the pandemic has done a lot to people. The people that saw it and took it and grew, and the people that just circled and circled and circled. Um, and, and in that, I learned that I don't need to be a suffering artist in fucking New York City. I mean, Tucson. Tucson's fucking small. Nobody Tucson's knows me. Small. I don't know anybody. I'm, I'm fucking by myself. Fucking and my now uh, and my fiance, now, uh, fiance, I'm fucking fiance, happy. happy. And I created this fucking created book. This fucking book. So, you so you don't need one and the other. And I created the book for myself. If if one person reads it, which is me, that'll be great. If a million people reading, it's dope. I don't care. And I think divorcing and those divorcing that idea of fucking like audience of like and this myth of the artist are very important. Are and, very I think important. That and I think that happens within, within yourself within first. Yourself. Yeah, thank, thank you for, yeah, thank uh, for the Q&A session. And, Q &A session. and um, you know, you'll see mentioned that, you know, one day we'll all be on the same uh, bookshelf. And, and uh, yesterday, last night, I mentioned how I have a bookcase at home is the nicest bookcase I have and is dedicated to the literature of the undocumented and uh, yeah I, I, I posted the, the photo of it on, on my social but um, but you know there is it's a lot of empty space there because right? I, I have it divided into four genres you know and the um, more poetry is being published more memoirs are being published I look forward to you know getting the memoirs and I know you'll see you're working on any uh, uh, on a creative nonfiction book, uh, but what I also said uh, well, last night was that the the, was that the fiction the shelf fiction is the one that's, <laughs> that's is not one really one growing as fast as the other one ones. So it's great to hear that Gladys is working on a novel there because I anticipate to write more more novels. And there's a lot of empty space, but you know it's to be a little cheesy here. Is like I see it as half full, right? The 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 bookcase there, and I think that more and more. And voices uh, like uh, voices you know like Alan and uh, and, uh, and Yossi and and, and, and Javier, have Javier have mentored, uh, have mentored you know y younger uh, writers younger and we, writers. we see that right and, and I think that, that you know uh, Alini and, and Gladys would then mentor Gladys kind of the younger writers and, and, and um, so uh, I think it'd be so good to see that that connection and I know that Yossi said you know we don't always have to write about what's honorable right that we can write about you know not so much mariposas but it could also be cucarachas. But I think you know, you and Cougar have, have a certain dignity to them when, when we write about it, right? Which I think might be different from being honorable, right? Uh, just a, a dignity and just living your life and, and, and trying to survive. And, and I know from all their work that sometimes they find that dignity, in, you know, with their, their, their relatives, their families, uh, their, their mothers. Uh, I know Lenny brought her, her mother again, just wanted to shout out to that. But so, so it was great to, to, to see that. It was great to have a gathering. and. Um, I hope you know the, the, the conversation continues. Uh, so thank you for, for joining us. Um, let's hear for the for the poets here and also for I believe we're going to work on a publication as well, as well as to capture, as well as the, voices to capture the voices that we hear and the conversation. So thank you again. So thank you again. Yeah. Yeah.